Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's event featuring Bob Pisani on his new book, Shut Up and Keep Talking, Lessons on Life and Investing from the Floor of New York Stock Exchange. He will be interviewed by Consuelo Mark, Mike, excuse me, <laughs> Managing Editor of WealthTrack. My name is Jim Kelly, Director of the Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis at Fordham University. On behalf of the Gabelli Center, welcome. In the last several years, the Gabelli Center and our wonderful co-presenters, the Museum of American Finance and the CFA Society of New York, have sponsored more than 50 events that have drawn more than 8,000 attendees. We are very proud of this dynamic collaboration, and a full archive of our video content will be shared in the thank you email you will receive. Since today's discussion addresses the history of the New York Stock Exchange during the last 25 years, I thought it might be interesting for you to know that Fordham is now offering a course in financial history taught by David Cowan, president of the Museum of American Finance, and Dick Silla, renowned economic historian and former chairman of the museum. The name of the course is Booms, Bubbles, Busts, and Crashes. Bob Pisani has certainly covered several of these extreme market events live on CNBC during the past 25 years. Bob and Consuelo will speak for about 40 minutes, at which point we will point out that they will address the questions submitted at the Q and A question field at the bottom of the video player. Please feel free to submit questions at any point during our event. We will be addressing as many of them as possible. Now I'm delighted to turn it over to David Cowan, president of the museum. Thanks, Jim. And I want you all to know that Jim recently received the Graham and Dodd Murray Greenwald Prize for Value Investing presented by none other than Mario Gabelli and GAM. Uh, so congratulations, Jim. Now, today I have the pleasure to introduce the interviewer for our program, as mentioned, Consuelo Mack. She is the executive editor and, uh, excuse me, executive producer and managing editor of Consuelo Mack Wealth Track, which is seen uh, nationwide on PBS. It's in its 18th season. You can also find it on YouTube. Consuelo is a pioneer in business television, being involved in several firsts. The first daily nationally syndicated business program, Today's Business, where she was founding partner, sole anchor, and executive editor. She also was in the first national morning business program, Business Times, where she was the news editor and co-anchor. Her long and distinguished career in business journalism includes nearly two decades as the anchor and managing editor of the Wall Street Journal Report which won the Overseas Press Club and Gracie Awards during her tenure. And it also includes time spent in her career at CNBC with none other than Bob Pisani. The two of them also share another wonderful credential, which is that they are both trustees of the Museum of American Finance and both are MCs at our annual gala. So it's my pleasure now to turn it over to Consuelo in conversation with Bob Pisani. Thanks so much, David. And really those two that you just mentioned, the fact that I got to work with Bob Pisani, and of course I watch him daily um, at CNBC, and, and also the fact that we are both now trustees of, of the Museum of American Finance. What uh, wonderful uh, associations those are for both of us. So Bob Pisani, um, if you follow the market, uh, he is the guy to go to. I mean, I would say he's the best in the business as far as he's a senior markets correspondent uh, at CNBC. He's been following the markets on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange for 25 years. And just to put Bob's career in perspective, when Bob started uh, at CNBC, actually as a real estate reporter, and we'll get to that in a moment, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was about 2,800. Since Bob started covering the markets, uh, you know, it's basically uh, been up 10 times. The Dow is now around 20. As a correspondent as the, uh, on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, it was at 6,600, so it's gone up more than fourfold. And Bob, I have to say, you know, one of the famous adages on Wall Street is, you know, follow the Fed, don't fight the Fed. And my newest adage, having read your book, 
shut up and keep talking is follow Hassani. So <laughs> that's my, <laughs> my investment advice at this point. But let me ask you about, um, you know, your career and this really wonderful book. And I'm just, you know, Bert Malkiel, uh, who is a, uh, a well-known professor uh, at, at an economist at Princeton, you know, wrote a blurb for you. And it basically said, you know, are you interested in investing uh, in this book? You'll find a love letter to the stock market. And this is a delightful read. And it is a love letter to the stock market, but Bob, you're so candid and you're irreverent. And so it's a love letter with warts and all about what the, has happened in the market and the characters in it and the celebrities that you know visit the floor of the New York Stock Exchange on a daily basis. And basically you've cu kind of covered it all. So, but my first question to you is shut up and keep talking. Where did that title come from? Well, thank you, and thanks for the wonderful, warm introduction. We, you and I have been friends for 30 years, and I very much value that. And, and like me, you're a, a survivor. We've seen a lot of stuff together, you and I. Um, I still think the best advice is don't fight the Fed over, you know, follow Pisani. So don't fight the Fed, folks. Right. Um, the, the book title, uh, I was speaking to the publisher, and the publisher, people are always interested in the mechanics of television for some reason. The most common question I get asked when people see me or in the airport or in the street, and it's, it's usually what's happening with the markets. They mean three to six months. But the second most common question, they ask me questions about television or what do I think of this person or what's it like? Uh, and the very common question is uh, when the publisher said, what do they say to you while you're waiting to go on the air? Because I have an, I, it's called an IFB, it's an earpiece, interruptible fullback is what it means, IFB. Um, and I said, well, you know, normally they can say anything, but producers are busy. So usually there's some variation on the word rap, which means shut up or stretch, which means keep talking. And the publisher said, that's it. Shut up and keep talking. That's really what you hear, right? I said, yeah, basically that's the title of the book. So it's a, sort of a play on what you hear when the producers are talking in your ear. I, I, I have to uh, remind our audience as well that uh, you started as a real estate reporter at CNBC in 1990. And actually, before your reporting career, you co you taught a course with your dad, um, Ralph Pisani, who is a, a real estate developer at Wharton. And, uh, and you also uh, co-authored a book with him about you know, real estate development. So you know, how did we get so lucky to have you start following the stock market and become a reporter when you could have been a very successful real estate developer? Well, my father was a, a poor Italian kid from the Bronx in Arthur Avenue uh, and got out in the late 50s when I was a little child, moved to Philadelphia. Um, his ticket out of the Bronx was United Airlines. They had the route to Hawaii and they had a big office in Philadelphia. He moved there with me as a child and my mother and became um, a, got into the real estate development business. Uh, in the early 1960s and became very successful at it and was friends with the head of the real estate center at Wharton. Um, and the two of them in the mid eighties um, decided to uh, teach a, a course on real estate development at Wharton that was fundamentally based uh, around the actual mechanics of real estate construction. Um, and Wharton was doing a lot of what I call spreadsheet stuff at the time. So he got accepted as an adjunct at the Wharton School, which was quite an honor for him from the Bronx, and called me up and said, I need you to help me to teach the course, because I'm not accustomed to teaching college level courses. And we, we wrote a course curriculum that was successful and submitted it to John Wiley as a book and used the course as the curriculum for the book. It came out in 1989. And by sheer dumb luck, Consuelo, this is what I call the serendipity of life. Um, CNBC went on the air the month the book came out in April 89. I had a friend who was one of the first people working at CNBC, and she said, why don't you come on as a guest? And I came on as a guest, and they hired me as the real estate correspondent in um, in the summer of 1990, one year after the, we went The on. first, right? And, and it was not uh, an, an, an easy, you kind of created the beat for CNBC. Yes. Um, in, in fact, I um, the fellow who hired me, Bob Davis, the vice president, said, you have right. to go down the hall. I want to have you because I think we need a real estate correspondent. CNBC was still figuring out what it was in the summer of 1990. And I said, OK, who, you have to talk to my, our lawyer. I said, who's the lawyer? Said, His name is David Zasloff. So I walked down the hall to meet David Zasloff. And David Zasloff was uh, very busy negotiating contracts for 
with, with the with the cable companies and he said what do you want and i said well i'm i'm here to i'm going to be the real estate correspondent bob davis sent me down he said I, I don't need a real estate correspondent i think we're probably going to become largely a stock market network um tell me why i need you i don't think i need you and i said well i'll tell you why because i think uh you have 40 percent of the country that owns stocks but 60 percent own a home and you call yourself CNBC, the Consumer News and Business Channel, and you don't have anybody covering that 60% that own a home. And I think you need that. And he stopped and looked at me and said, that was a very good answer. Okay, I'm gonna give you a contract, but it's not gonna be a long one because I don't know if you can do the kind of work on air that we need you to do. And he was very skeptical about it. David Zasloff and I became friends and I signed the crummy deal that he offered me at the time and renegotiated it six months later. But David Zasloff now runs Warner, of course, he's still there. And occasionally I'll see him and remind him that I owe my career largely to his cynical bet on me uh, as his real estate correspondent. So by 1996, we had started getting ratings at CNBC. Um, didn't have much ratings at all in the beginning. But what right. changed everything was the internet. Um, the Netscape IPO in August 1995 kind of woke everyone up to this shiny new object called the internet. And it was a sensation, that IPO. And suddenly we started getting real ratings and we were getting ratings, not because I was the real estate course, we were getting ratings because all of a sudden the internet was hot, NASDAQ was hot, and then we had at the same time slowly evolving ability to trade at home. This was never really available before, as you know, Consuelo, but uh, mm -hmm. new software and new hardware coalesced to allow things like um, trading programs at home. Uh, they were slow and cumbersome initially, but that combined with the internet, combined with a new medium, uh, television financial news largely led uh, by us, uh, ultimately by CNBC, so to kind of combined to create this real sensation. And our ratings went up in direct relationship to the NASDAQ volume. You could actually see it. We used to plot it. And so NASDAQ, as NASDAQ volume kept going up, which was speculative internet stuff, CNBC's ratings kept going up all the way into the summer of 2000. I saw that and I said, well, gee, I'd rather be where the action is. Uh, and right. I so 1997, you made the right. switch from the real estate to the stocks correspondent. Right. right. And that that was a pretty momentous year. Um, actually, you're absolutely right. Uh, the Internet stocks were taking off. Uh, momentum was building. Uh, but also then, you know, something else happened. And uh, you write about it in the book. And it's fascinating. Uh, and, you know, and, and it's the, the you know Asian crisis quickly followed by the Russian financial crisis long-term capital, a famous hedge fund that, you know, was basically run by all of these really brilliant, uh, you know, guys, and that went belly up. So, you know, and, and, and I'm thinking when you said about, uh, you know, your explanation of why they should hire you as a real estate reporter, Bob, you know, you're, you think on your feet, you're articulate, you know, you can turn things around at a time. I, I always marvel at that. But but tell us about the crises. I mean, how you handled the crises uh, in the stock market, what that was like. Well, the Asian financial crisis happened because of efforts uh, by uh, what we, we call them Asian tigers at that time to attract investment capital. And the way, of course, they did that was uh, you know, interest uh, interest rates. Uh, and when all of a sudden um, they started raising interest rates here in the late mid to 90s, 1990s, uh, capital started coming out. This is an eternal problem with emerging markets. And their right. their currencies were pegged to the United States uh, dollar. And this started to be a real problem. So flows came out rather dramatically. Uh, 96 was a real disaster in the Thai market. And then it's kind of spilled over into our market. So in October 1997, we never had circuit breakers kick in before. A after the great after the big stock market dropped in october 87 when it dropped 22 percent one day the sec suggested a couple of things that would be a good way to have we needed to have some way to trade the market more liquidly this was an early uh shot across the bow to suggest uh etfs and intraday trading and secondly they said we really should consider some kind of circuit breaker this had been debated for decades and nobody could come up with anything and they came up with an idea uh, of a certain point level on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and nobody paid any attention to it because it never happened until October of 97, I think it was October 27th, when all of a sudden the circuit breakers kicked in, the market stopped trading at 3.30 in the afternoon. So instead of closing at four, it closed at 3.30, and everybody was shocked that this could happen, that the circuit breakers actually kicked in. This, this kicked off a long discussion that took several years about what the right level of circuit breakers 
was. I don't want to get into that whole story, but it's still debated right. today. So today there's sure. circuit breaker halts if the S&P drops 7 percent and then 13 percent and 20 percent different levels. But that was the first time it ever happened. And I can I remember being on the floor and Ron and Sana tossing down to me saying, those of you who think the market has closed, it's 401. Uh, I'm sorry, it closed half an hour ago. Bob, tell us what happens. And I, I saw the broadcast that I did when I was writing the book. I actually found it. I, I, most of this is not available, but I found it. And it's amazing how um, fast I'm talking and how pissed <laughs> up my voice is, because that's what happens to me when I get, I'm trying to process a lot of information right. and talk about it at the same time. And I could tell I'm a little shell shocked here because the traders around me are all look like, you know, they, they had, you know, they, they had been in a washing machine on the spin cycle overnight. Um, so that was that was quite traumatic and difficult. Uh, but it was only the start of all sorts of amazing things that happened in the next few years. Right. So, so Bob, explain, you know, you have a tremendous amount of noise. Uh, that you're getting the input is just phenomenal. I mean, I, I know you get like 600 emails a day um, and but also there's news coming in. So how do you decide what's important? How do you decide what you're going to cover on a given day? Well, your ability to sort of um, filter out stuff is is one of the things you learn very quickly. And because if you can't, it overwhelms you. Right. Um, it has gotten the fire hose has gotten greater, not lesser um and it's it's very simple you have to find a way to make sense of it otherwise you're overwhelmed and can't function so in the book i have a series of maxims uh, that i've developed over the years one of them is talk make sense employed don't talk don't make sense unemployed so if you can't figure out a way to make a coherent story out of things you're not going to survive and the way i've done it over the years is i've actually um well i have increase the amount of information I look at, I'm very discerning. And part of the is because after 32 years of doing this, I'm as seasoned as anyone I'm talking to. In fact, in right. most cases, I'm more seasoned. And so are you. Mm -hmm. You know more often than the people that you're talking to. Uh, and that leads to a very interesting situation. So you can filter out a lot of noise very quickly. You might get 600 emails. I do. But there's no way that I actually look at all that information. So much of it is analyst commentary. Um, well, here's what our home building analyst has to say. A lot of right. it is garbage. Um, and I say that very clearly. Um, you do. I, I mean, you're, you're not kind to the analyst community on Wall Street. Uh, and at, at one point, I remember, you know, being at CNBC and, you know, any if you were a financial reporter, I mean, basically you used to cover what the analysts were saying. I mean, those were the, the people, mostly guys. Uh, now, luckily, not so. A lot of women as well, but they are the ones who knew the you know the granularity of the the in depth stories of a of a particular sector and also uh, particular stocks. But uh, you say that they're you know largely not useful to you. Why not? Well, the problem was they were, uh, and I used to get a lot yeah. of information off being on the floor and a lot of information talking to analysts. I did um, too. Uh, right. Spitzer in two thousand three. Uh, Elliot Spitzer, one of the and one of the few things I agreed with him on is he, he basically sued Wall Street and said the analyst community is engaged in collusion um, with, uh, with with the sales community um, that's out there that's selling IPOs. And in exchange for favorable coverage uh, from the analysts, the, the firms will get business, the IPO business. This was, um, I think, largely correct, frankly. I think there was clear conflicts of interest. Oh, there was. Mm -hmm. And he called them on it. And they had to have what's called, what's called the global settlement. And essentially what happened was they had to figure out a way to pay the analysts. This is the big issue. How do you pay analysts? Where does the money come from? It used to come from essentially the capital markets people. And they said, you can't do that. So then right, they investment banking, right? That's where they thing. got their piece. Yes, yep. investment banking. They, they, they used to. Then they said, "Okay, we'll pay you out of what they call soft dollars. Uh, if you send a certain amount of business our way, we'll give you the research." And so it kind of came out of the trading end of things. And this has been a problem for years. They can't figure out how to pay the analysts. And what actually happened is most of the really good analysts left because the pay dropped dramatically. A lot of them went to the buy side. Some of them just left the business completely. And what's happened over the years is the, the analyst community has gotten smaller and the pay has gotten smaller. And mm -hmm. what they tend to do now is simply mimic whatever their 
CEOs are saying, there's the, the amount of original research that's done is much, much smaller than it used to be. So the quality of the information, the originality of the thinking is much lower right. than it used to be. And I don't find it terribly useful. Now, strategists are a little different. There are smaller groups. A lot of that I don't find useful at all. To answer your question, what happens is you become very discerning at what works and what doesn't work and what you think is useful and what isn't. And so I, I found my my contact list from 1999, uh, a few years ago, I had 500 people on I was talking to in 1999. I can't believe I was talking to 500 people. Yeah. It's amazing. But there they are with the phone numbers in front of my eyes. 80% uh, of them are gone. Uh, yeah. They're out of the business. Uh, and what's happened now is I don't talk to 500 people. Yeah. I probably on any regular basis talk to under 100. Uh, and But I don't need to talk to five Apple analysts. If I'm an, if I'm an Apple mm -hmm. student, trader or, or a commentator, I would, but I'm not. I'm the stocks correspondent. That's a high level position. I, I need to talk to two whose opinions, and this is what matters. You have to find someone whose opinions you respect, who you believe they know what they're talking about, and who can give you an honest opinion. And that's they're right. not necessarily the same things. As you know, everyone talks their book. Everyone has an agenda. Everyone's pushing something. And you have to be able to filter that out. But there are people who can give you a more honest opinion than others. And you can figure that out if you do this long enough. So the, I don't need to talk to 100 people a, a day. I might read 100 reports very quickly, but getting 100 people on the phone is not something I'm going to do on a daily basis anymore. I need a much smaller group. Uh, and so you, get, you just get better at it. Or either that or you just you, you don't survive. You, you can't yeah. handle it. So, so, so you, you do name names uh, in the book in, in Shut Up uh, and Keep Talking. And so, so tell us, you know, I'm just, I'm thinking, so when the market is, you know, when we're in a financial crisis, uh, when the market's melting down, who do you call to say what's going on? You know, well, just, I'm not, you... not going to go over my, my own personal list of people that, that I call. Okay. I will typically call uh, several sell side trading desks. One of the problems with talking to sell side desk is the same problem would happen on the floor, which is as the floor went to electronic trading, uh, originally when you had people who were on the floor doing open outcry with orders to buy and sell, literally it, on a pad, you could see what was going on. You could see order right. flow. That kind of dissipated as the market went electronic. And now what you see is streams of 100 share orders to buy or sell different stocks. And it's much different. It's much more difficult to make a clear narrative out of things necessarily right so you can call sell side desks too but they'll be seeing the same thing they'll be able to tell you gee awful lot of orders you know sell pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. and things like that but it's it's the, the, creating narratives is a little more difficult than it used to be when you had a, a source on the floor where there were just four thousand people on the floor with orders to buy that's that, that was the other thing i was going to ask you bob i mean when when you started in the business uh you know, 80% of the trading in New York Stock Exchange stocks was done on the floor. It's now down to 20%. So why does the New York Stock Exchange, the floor still matter? Well, it matters because the open, the, the concept where people will show up, and most of this now happens on the open and close, um, still matters as a product differentiator against the NASDAQ. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think very highly of NASDAQ and uh, equally mm -hmm. highly of the NYSE. So it's never, for me, it's never been NYSE versus NASDAQ. I, I understand and I talk about the history of NASDAQ in the book and why it's there, why NASDAQ is very important. Um, but the open outcry model has always been a little different. NASDAQ was created essentially as a way to trade over the counter securities in the early 1970s because they, they were so illiquid and the bid right. asked so wide. They figured, listen, we ought to put them on uh, a, a screen. Originally, NASDAQ was just screen based. You didn't you couldn't trade through the screen. You could only see the prices on the screen. But even that in 1975 was a, was revolutionary. And eventually NASDAQ, of course, went to all, uh, you know, electronic trading where you could trade on the screen. Um, and that happened a little bit, bit later. So the the important thing is uh, there there is still a slightly different model that exists um, that still the NYSC still believes uh, add some value, but you can see the, the one thing that's very obvious here is the march of technology and technological disruption and innovation. Electronic trading offered faster trading and most would argue narrower bid ask spreads. Uh, that's debatable, but I, I think that most would argue that that's the case. And yes, more efficiency. when things are going well. Yes, more efficiency <laughs> is the, I think is the key here. So yeah. the, 
there's a reason that this happened. And you, when you study technological disruption, this is a very good example of it. Um, so, Bob, you mentioned how much noise there is that you learn to discern what's really important uh, in in the news. So, what is important? You know, for for individual investors, that's your viewer viewership. Also, I mean, you've got you know professional investors as well. You've got people like me watching. Uh, but what are the important uh, developments or events that that you are going to cover that you know are going to be market moving? And you certainly mentioned you know don't fight the Fed for starters. So you know what what should we we, we be when paying I, attention when I to? Get in the, when I come in uh, and before I look in, the first thing that I always look at is S and P futures. Years ago, it used to be the Tokyo uh, open and close. Believe it or not, I wake up at five o'clock and look at how Tokyo did. Um, that relationship is not quite uh, as good as it used to be. So I tend to look oh, at interesting. futures. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will usually, the first thing I'll, I'll do is just check any macro and see what's going on. Uh, anything happened overnight. Then I'm, the, other than that, I'll look for um, mm -hmm. what comments are being made by some of the strategists and analysts. Most of the time it's noise and I don't pay a lot of attention. Occasionally you get strategists and analysts who are a big deal that will make a comment. Uh, that'll happen. Uh, Jamie Dimon yesterday is a very good example. He's very widely followed and very respected. Um, and he said, you know, we, we could drop 20% more on the S&P. That actually moved the markets. Right. Um, I, I would ask a simple question, I and mean, this is a different stock topic, but how good is Jamie Dimon's record calling the stock market? Um, I, you know, you'll find out most of these guys, they're not very good at this. Uh, in fact, nobody is very good. Nobody. At this. <laughs> but uh, nobody ever wants to talk about that. I'm happy to talk about it with you. But yeah. Um, so then I look, then I will look at economic news. Uh, so the, for example, the PPI uh, is coming out. And Producer the price, price index. Price, mm -hmm. Consumer price index is coming out Thursday. These things move the market. And so you want to know what Wall Street's sense is of where it's going. There are estimates that are out. You also want to know is beating the number or going below the number going to be good or bad news. And that's sometimes very difficult to discern. You get this, we're in this bizarre world right now where bad news is good news, good news is bad news. It's very hard to explain to the viewers how the market would react, uh, you know, when you have a, an economic number that looks bad and the market goes up. Why is the market going up? You have to sort of spend a lot of time understanding the markets, taking the market's temperature and understanding what's going on. So you spend an awful lot of time trying to read the market since, and it still surprises you. I wish I could tell you I, I had, you know, perfect view through, uh, but it, it will often surprise me too. So you get very humble about about this game. Other than that, th this is the way you look at it as a journalist. You come in every morning. I, I just described a whole bunch of facts and ideas. Mm -hmm. Imagine something on the wall. You got like 50 stick of notes on the wall, just blank. You come in in the morning six o'clock in the morning and each one of them you fill in with a different fact just what i talked to you about economic news analyst calls whatever your job as a journalist is to connect all those facts that's what journalism is it's drawing connections between all those facts and making a narrative out right of telling the story right some days it's tough to do and some days the market doesn't act like there is a coherent narrative and sometimes you just have to have to say that um uh, uh, but usually you can sort of get some kind of sense of, of where things are going. Uh, and as I said, if you keep doing it years and years, and one of the things that's unusual about you and me is we have stuck to it for years right. and years. You and I are very unusual. Most people never stay in the same job for decades on end. And, and that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Uh, when the publisher came to me, he said, look, there, there's only one interest, reason we're interested in this. You're very unusual. Most people like you moved long ago to something else. And so you're inch wide and mile deep. Uh, you and I, you too, Consuelo, are both very right, well yeah. known. Real thing in the world called the stock market. And most people never stay long enough to acquire that kind of wisdom. And perspective. And that's why we're interested in having you do this book. So, right. And, and but Bob, but for, you know, from an individual investor point of view, uh, you know, how much does what goes on in the stock market on a daily basis matter? Not much. Um, okay. in a, on a, you know, Burton Malcolm's book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. Right. It, it's based the monkey on the, at the at the dartboard. Well, right. it's based on the idea that and Robert Schiller spent a lot of time looking at this. A, a lot of days, the stock market just wanders around and 
financial journalists like us attempt to create narratives around it. But people like Robert Schiller pointed out that oftentimes the market will drift up and there's no obvious particular reason. There's no obvious economic number. There's no and it'll drift down. There's no it, it tends to drift around a lot, which is why I, I mean, in the book, I talk about the real value of long term investing. But look, there are people who are dying to trade the market every day. Right. And there always has been. Um, but the evidence is very clear that in general, trading a lot does not produce superior returns. Market timing, tr deciding to go into the market at this time and then go out at this time does not generally work. The academic evidence is overwhelming on this. I'm not against people who like to trade. We all know this. Uh, we found this out the first year at CNBC. We got the highest response from people who loved hearing about what we call the horse race, the daily who's winning and losing in the stock market, who's up and down on a daily basis. Because there's a significant group of people that want to trade that, just like they want to bet on the Yankees game. So good. Um, and I have nothing against that. We. I don't stamp my feet and say, oh, no, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. Even though I'm a Jack Bogle disciple, I suspect you are, too. Mm -hmm. um, Jack was the founder of Vanguard and believed in the value of index funds and uh, and, and indexing and staying investing. Uh, there are people who'd like to trade and uh, you have to figure out a way to address that audience or else you're going to sound, you know, very, very much like an ideologue if you stamp your feet and says, oh, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Right. You know, you, you mentioned uh, Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winning economist from Yale, uh, who wrote a phenomenal book called Irrational Exuberance. And actually, it was published in the year 2000 at the you know peak of the dot com bubble. Uh, right. And also, you know, Jack Bogle, founder of Vanguard, who basically uh, you know created the index funds, mutual index funds. And, uh, you know, you've you've interviewed a number of the greats. Uh, who, who has had the greatest and you write, you know, write about them in the book, but who has had the greatest influence on you as far as your understanding of the markets and um, and and why? Well, when you do write a book like this, there's a quasi memoir, not a memoir and a quasi financial. It's kind of a mishmash. You have to confront some big existential questions like, well, all right, what what do I know? <laughs> How do I know that I know this. Where did I acquire this information I think I have? Isn't it still relevant? Is it still true? Um, so what I did was I went back and thought about what do I actually know? And you come up with a few pages of things that are core beliefs that I have about life in the markets. And where did I acquire this information? And I look around, I kept thinking about this. Uh, it took two and a half years. And I realized that there was a small group of people in the mid early 1990s that were, had a huge intellectual influence on me. Mm -hmm. uh, first among them was Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard. I met him in the summer of 97 uh, and had a profound impact on the way I looked at the world. Um, his book, Common Sense on Mutual Funds came out in 99. It is still to this day my Bible on most things. Um, I, I was so influenced by him. I, I opened a account, Vanguard account for my wife uh, that year. Still there, still have it. Uh, and, and, and and what 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 was the profound influence? I mean, what was it? When I called that, Bogle, Bogle the first time, I got him on the phone, and he said, "You know, uh, Mr. Pisani, I'm I I like your television station. He called the television station, uh, and but I have a lot of problems with what you people are doing. You you are making stars out of these people you think are investing gurus. Bill Miller had been on a lot." from mm -hmm. Lake Mason. Uh, and he said, Mr. Miller's a nice fellow, but you know, they're like a needle in a haystack. You know, Mr. Pisani, they're very hard to find and they generally don't keep outperforming year after year and they generally charge too much. And I'd mm -hmm. like to see more about long-term investing and I'd like to see more about index investing. Uh, the, the Vanguard 500 fund, um, which was a mutual fund, um, was, was there. Uh, and by 1997, there was the first um, mutual uh, ETFs, yeah, the Spider ETF, SPY, had already been trading. Um, and he said, I'd like to hear more about long-term investing. From and he was very pleasant, but professorial to me. That's the word I would describe it. Right. And we became friends. Uh, I, I only met him a few times, oddly. He came down to the NYSE, um, but I talked to him on the phone. And um, you, you, he just had an enormous influence on me in terms of looking at indexing, long-term investing and the the idea that you should pay a lot of attention to costs low if he was not against active investing uh, jack bogle uh he helped found some of the active funds at vanguard including capital opportunities that's still there what he was right. against 
passionately was high cost. He believed that in the rare case when you had an an active trader, uh, a, a, a investor who outperformed, they usually failed because the fees they charge ate into any alpha that they had, outperformance. And he said, if you have active investing, if you want to invest in active management, make sure it's low cost. So those are the big things there. And he also said, look, you might think there is no difference between a you know, 1% uh, 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 difference in your portfolio or 2%, but over decades, it matters a lot. And I remember being influenced by this table that explained compounding interest, essentially, that showed uh, you know, a, a, the difference between uh, in, in 1% or 2% returns over 30 years can amount to tens of thousands and in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and he said, small numbers matter a lot when you're dealing with long periods of time. Other than that, I would say uh, Wharton Professor Jeremy Siegel had stocks for the long run out. Stocks for the long run. Mm-hmm. And he, he did 200 years of studies on stocks and bonds um, and, and why stocks had outperformed bonds for the most part in that period, mm-hmm. not always. Uh, Burton Malkiel had written a random walk down Wall Street. He was Right in now the- in his 50th year. That was That's published right. 50 years ago. And yep. Charlie Ellis had written a, a, a marvelous book, uh, <clears throat> Winning the Loser's Game, where he right. explained why it, why active managers could not outperform and what the reasons were for that. And we could talk about that. But these are some of the people that influenced me and Robert Schiller as well. Schiller came along and made a very important observation. Uh, this was even before the 90s. He had done this in the 80s. He said, if, if the stock market if you buy a stock, you are buying essentially a, a dividend and a potential future stream of earnings. That's sort of the combination of why you're buying a stock. And you would expect a certain volatility level if this was true, if there was perfectly rational investing. But what he found was that the volatility level of the stock market was much higher than would be accounted for by simply fundamental investing. And what mm-hmm. he said was there is a somewhat, he concluded that there appears to be a somewhat irrational component to investing that would account for this extra volatility. And this is the birth of behavioral finance or behavioral Right, and, and talk about that because that is, that the, the birth of behavioral finance uh, did happen kind of under your watch. Uh, and it's become you know much well, more influential now. And you certainly, you know, you witnessed behavioral finance and how behavior affects investors firsthand through, you know, numerous crises, uh, both booms and busts on Wall Street. Well, what what behavioral economics taught me was simple. First off, Schiller showed there is some kind of irrational component to investing. And he showed the high volatility. Uh, And and what happens is um, the the, there are biases that affect people's judgments. And there's an enormous literature on this now. So, and there's two basic kinds of biases where people screw up. There are, are uh, emotional biases that are uh, errors of feeling, and there are cognitive biases that are errors of thinking. So an emotional bias would be something like overconfidence, like, oh, I think I've been right, therefore I'm going to be right you know, from now on. Uh, right. Another classic is loss aversion. This is a very famous one. People fear a loss more than they than, than the expectations of the gain. So people will hold on to a losing stock position because they, they just fear the loss a lot. Uh, and there's other emotional bias, like herd behavior. We just do things in groups. Uh, and all of these cause confusion and mistakes in, in your decision making. Then there's cognitive errors. So people will um, com- they'll have a confirmation bias. You know, people will only select information that they think is right or that they want to believe. That's called a confirmation bias. They won't look at stuff that does it contradicts what they want to believe. So there's errors of reasoning that exist out there. These 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 confirmation these biases, and they affect what you do. This gets to a much bigger question, which is why is everybody so bad at predicting the future? If you look at this, it's not. We like to make jokes like amateur, you know, uh, retail people don't know how to pick stocks. Well, it turns out professional people Josh. don't know how to pick stocks yeah. either. Uh, and not only that, it turns out economic forecasting is terrible. The, Federal the Fed Reserve is itself, a good example of that, actually. Yes. The Federal yeah, Reserve itself has a terrible track. Terrible record. record. Mm-hmm. Terrible. And so you, if you do this long enough, and you and I have been doing this a long time, you have to ask yourself, what the hell is going on? Why is everybody <laughs> so bad? Not just some retail dum-dum. Everybody is. And it turns out this is what behavioral economics studies a lot is – Number one, you have these biases that infect your forecasting, even if you're a professional. 
And number two, there's another additional um, problem. There is something about the unknowability of the future. Think, think if you're an analyst and it's December and you have to make a guess about the earning stream of, your, of the company you're covering a year from now. You think that's easy. It turns out to be almost impossible because yeah. there are so many things that can go into this. There's macro factors. There's company factors. It could be bought out. Uh, it could have a big competitor. The CEO could fall ill. There are literally, when you actually start thinking about it, millions of potential variables that can affect that. And our ability to make those predictions, because some of it is unknown, is not very high. There's actually analogies with weather that exists here where weather forecasting is pretty good these days, three, four days out. But when you go out more than about a week, it's pretty bad. And yeah. in this kind of analysis, when you go out in economic forecasting more than you know short periods of time, a few months, it gets really bad. It, the ability to see the future falls off. So number one, why are people clueless on the future? There are biases that infect their, their analysis and there are certain amounts of unknowability uh, about about the right. future. Yeah, well, in, in your bibliography, which is extensive of all the wonderful books that you've read and that you recommend, there's a, a wonderful uh, economist named Peter Bernstein, who's uh, alas, no longer with us, but he wrote a great book yeah. uh, called Against the Gods, The Remarkable Story of Risk. And one of the things that he said, you know, the future is unknowable, the future is unknowable, the future is unknowable. And that's exactly, uh, you exactly. know, what 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 you've, you've figured out. So um, just let me just finish my point. Go ahead. Uh, Behavioral yeah. economics. So what do you get out of this? And again, this is discussed in the books. Um, behavioral economics, which purports to study how people really behave, not how they're supposed to behave. That's what behavioral economics is. We're telling you people don't buy low and sell high. They buy high and sell low. They do the opposite. Why? That behavioral economics studies why that happens. But the effects of this, when it started becoming widely dispersed in the, in the 90s and 2000s, was it gave a huge boost, boost to indexing because People said, look, I'm not going to analyze myself and everybody around me. If everybody is biased, then why don't we just stay into investing and stay the market? So it gave a boost to in, uh, 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 indexing. Uh, number two, uh, it, there was a whole fight about this, about whether the markets are efficient or not. And the way I approach this is they're not efficient, but they're efficient enough. Stocks mm -hmm. can't be mispriced, but don't think, of, don't worry about it too much. The third thing I keep saying to people is, it's possible to train people to be better forecasters. And I would highly recommend a book uh, called Super Forecasting by Philip Tetlock, who's a professor at the University sure. of Pennsylvania. He had a big mm -hmm. influence on me. He thought about everything I just said and wrote a whole book about why people are so bad at forecasting and how they could be improved. And it turns out people who are better at forecasting than others tend to be more open-minded than others. So he created two groups, foxes and hedgehogs. Hedgehogs are people who have ideologies and they sort of put their ideology on the world. They have a certain worldview, they stay with it. Foxes are people who are more open to different ideas and change their opinions of forecasting as new information came in. He found, it, found out that the foxes are generally better. So it's possible to train people to think more rationally about investing, but Consuelo, I'm not very optimistic about it. I wouldn't. I don't expect too much. You know why? Because investing wisdom is re is ver really in short supply, and you see this financial illiteracy, just plain stupidity, uh, yeah. and and idiocy is is rampant. I don't know if it's worse than thirty years ago, but it's certainly not much better. And then even people who know better continue to make you know dumb mistakes. And I, there's a well, chapter in the book, the hardest part of the book, writing about my own investing mistakes. Yeah. So let's talk, I, let's, let's talk about that to Bob. You know, you've got all of this perspective. You've got all of this information, you know, you figured out what people do right and wrong. So, you know, how do you invest personally? Well, uh, this is a part of the book that was the most important part of the book because I'm astonished how many people out there, um, nobody ever asked me what I own. Been doing this 30 years. It almost never happens. Maybe people don't want to ask a personal question, but right. I'm also annoyed about people in the investing community who constantly talk about stocks they're recommending and nobody never say what they actually own. They so own. what do you own? <laughs> okay. It's, I'm mostly, I'm a Jack Vogel disciple. Almost everything I own are index funds. Uh, so right. my hard, largest holdings at S&P 500 index fund. I own mid cap index fund. I own small cap value uh, index fund. I own international fund. So um, broadly diversified index fund portfolio. But in all yeah. fairness, Bob, at, when I was at CNBC many years ago, we were forbidden to own individual stocks yeah, at one point. And are. so it's not like, so if you had a choice, would wouldn't you do be, it. Would, you wouldn't no. do it. Why not? No. I, well, there, there's 
maybe one or two preferred stocks that I would own that would, I find attractive from a valuation point of view right now. But no, because you think you can pick stocks and you can't. That's the evidence. The evidence is if I, I love people who call me up and said, well, you know, Bob, I have a very diversified portfolio. I said, really, tell me. Well, I have 15 stocks, uh, all from the S&P 100. I said, right. that is not a broadly diversified portfolio. That's a fairly risky portfolio. Actually. But, but uh, Bob, mutual funds versus ETFs, because you've done a lot of work in ETFs. And then I see there are questions coming over the transom. Uh, so we're going to uh, basically turn okay. this over to Jim Kelly and to David Cowan in a minute to get the audience's questions. Um, but ETFs versus mutual funds. Generally, I own ETFs. However, I can tell you, in some cases, it doesn't matter that much. Like Vanguard, for example, it's just part of a different, uh, it, it, it's essentially the same. The ETFs are the same as the mutual right. funds. Um, but uh, you, you want to own generally mutual funds because they have a better tax structure generally. So if you have an ETF that's an actively managed fund, uh, it's in much better position than a mutual fund that's actively managed. Because if you have a mutual fund actively managed and you have a manager that's buying and selling a lot of stocks, you can get potentially hit with capital gains that are very serious. Uh, and in an ETF, that because of the structure of the ETF, the, the, the participating market maker actually does the trades and it does not re result in a taxable event. So there right. are some very clear tax advantages to owning ETFs, particularly when you are in an actively managed fund. Um, I have, you know, a, a probably three hours more of questions, but I think I better get somebody else involved in this, Bob. So uh, David and Jim, do, do you want to ask Bob some of the questions that you're getting from the field? Questions now, if they could, please. Uh, I was just thinking about one, Bob, and having read the book about cultivating relationships and wondering, first of all, were you accepted right away on the floor? Secondly, didn't you spend a fair bit of time after hours making sure to keep that cultivation going? How did you do it? And third, particularly for the younger people that may not know, you know, the legend of Art Cash, and if you could just say a few words about him. Yeah, I got there in the summer of 1997. I had been on the floor for a few years before that on intermittent base, but uh, let me tell you something. It is quite amazing to have 4,000 people on the floor, potential sources of information, and most of them wouldn't talk to me because that was a very exclusive club back then. It was a very rarefied atmosphere, and they considered themselves very privileged and really a fraternity, to be perfectly frank, frank about it. And they weren't sure they could trust me, and they didn't want anyone going on the air saying, oh, I just talked to John Smith over here who, uh, you know, is uh, buying um, oil stocks for a client. They don't, they didn't want that. Uh, they didn't want anything like that. They wanted, uh, they didn't even like having reporters around for the most part. Um, so I had to work very hard. And, and there were two people that made, there were a number of people that stepped forward and I became friends with. But one was Jimmy McGuire. Jimmy was um, with uh, Henderson and he was Warren Buffett specialist. He was the Berkshire Hathaway um, specialist. He and Warren Buffett were friends. And he liked me from the very beginning. He was very powerful on the floor and charismatic. He introduced me to Warren Buffett in 97 and Warren Buffett didn't talk to the press. I got to spend some time with him at the time. And the other was, uh, was Art Cashin, uh, who um, is now with, with UBS, was with Payne Weber at the time. And Art Cashin was a legendary guy on the floor who had been writing a newsletter for decades on the floor. and was sort of like one of the great raconteurs of, on Wall Street. A raconteur is a storyteller. He never went to college. He learned his craft on the floor, um, became a member in 1965, started working in the early 60s, um, and never went to college. He said his university were the bars <laughs> around the, the stock exchange where he spent decades uh, and where I have spent decades with him, I, can, <laughs> I think, for that fact. Um, so what happened to Art was he had a particular gift for storytelling. He was not a journalist, but he had journalistic instincts. Uh, and he knew exactly that uh, how to tell a story to illustrate something. He had very little use for academic theories. A lot of the things I discuss in the book as well, like efficient market hypothesis, he, he doesn't care about. He'll tell you a story to illustrate it. And I'll, uh, give me 30 seconds, I'll tell you one of his most famous ones. He, we used to try to explain price discovery. How do you know what's the right price to, for stock? And he said, well, you know, one day, uh, Louis Tiffany, the real Louis Tiffany, the guy who founded Tiffany, uh, was friends with J.P. Morgan, and he sent him a, a, a diamond stick pen. This is the early 1900s. 
And he said, Mr. Mr. Morgan, I know you like stick pins. Here's one of the finest ones available. We made it right here, $5,000. If you'd like it, keep it, and please send me a check for $5,000. And he gets a note back from JP Morgan. He opens and says, my dear Mr. Tiffany, this is a magnificent stick pin, but the price is a little excessive. Uh, I would offer you $4,000 for this. Here is the box with the stick pin in it uh, and a check for $4,000. If you accept this, please cash the check and send me this tie pin. And, and Tiffany thinks about it and says to the messenger, uh, calls him over and writes a note, says, Mr. Morgan, thank you very much, but I think it's worth 5,000. I hope we can do business in the future, sends the messenger off. And he's walking out, he's, he opens the box to take the stick pin out. And inside the box is a check for $4,000, for $5,000, excuse me, uh, and no stick pin and just a note from JP Morgan that says, just checking the price. Price discovery. It. So there's price discovery. They were feeling each other out and uh, essentially, in a sense, um, to, uh, Morgan called his bluff on that, but didn't know it till the end. That's how Art Cashin operated. He told stories, and you sit with him in bars for 25 years, and he tells endless amounts of stories. So he knew how to explain things, and his newsletter is widely read uh, on Wall Street. Uh, even today, he had a great story about uh, about the 1920s and in the devaluation of the Deutsche Mark uh, back in the 1920s. Uh, and, and why that set off worldwide panic. Uh, so th this is what, uh, these are people, when I got here, there were guys still around from the 1940s and 50s. These people brooked no shit from anybody. They were classic old traders, drinkers for the most part. Uh, and they were like art and art's one of the last of the dying breed. And I learned sitting there talking to these guys, what it was like. And when you were on the floor and you said, I'm buying 10,000 shares of Pfizer, you know, you were on the hook. You, and he, he art used to say in the old days, your met, your word is your bond. You're, you bought it. You're, you're the, you're the broker for the company, but for an intermediary, you're an intermediary, you're a broker, but it's your word. You're the one who said, I buy. And it's your it's your deal right now and you own that deal uh, and it was sort of big codes of honor that operated on the floor yeah, and it was a were, wonderful time to those were the days watch. yep yeah it's changed a lot are there other questions yes. david and jim yep. yeah, yeah. Here's, here's one from maureen besher what's your advice to owners of equities in these current and near future volatile times stay long uh well, I, I don't know what owner I, if you're talking about investors uh, ask me what I do. Uh, I don't do, I've done nothing. In the last two years, I've done uh, almost nothing. I, I describe a, a very small change I made uh, at the end of 2021. I shifted slightly, I had a growth fund, the Vanguard growth fund, and I shifted to a Vanguard, you know, mid cap fund, the same, essentially from growth to just standard. So That's rebalancing. A big you're doing right. a little bit I, of rebalancing. I, and generally, right. I don't do any of that. I haven't really done anything like that in 12 years. When the Fed made a big change after the financial crisis and they pumped a lot of money into the system, I kind of inferred that um, rates would stay low. I wasn't big on bonds and I tilted a little bit towards growth. But that was a big thing to me. I still was invested. So here's how I'm 75% in stocks, 20% uh, uh, 15 percent bonds and maybe eight eight to ten percent cash unusual high cash right now but I, I it's a 75 percent stock position has changed and i'm 67 years old i'm planning to live till 90. now i used to plan to live to 85 and all the smart people the actuarials kept telling me bob that's a big mistake technology is so good you're going to live to 90 and you you should probably work on 95. so what does that mean it means i'm 67 I have another 30 years of investing. A down year like today, this year, isn't going to make any difference in, in, in 20 years from now. Um, so don't get too spooked by the market. Jack Bogle used to say, don't just do something, stand there. Th think about this. It right, is in your very hands. difficult to... It, it, Warren Buffett used to say, think of investing as you only have 10 decisions to make your whole life. If you only have 10, you're going to be very careful. If you have millions, you're going to make all sorts of mistakes. So generally, the idea is have a plan, stay with it, and don't, don't allow your emotions to get the better of you. So here's what you have to believe in. Here's a core belief. 
you have to believe in capitalism, number one. Number two, you have to believe in a style of capitalism as practiced in the United States. And you could say, well, it's you know ruthless or whatever, but I happen to believe in that. Um, and so I believe in the United States and the United States economy and in capitalism in general. And by the way, in democracy, da da da, white flag, all of that stuff. And yes, if I didn't, by the way, I wouldn't be the kind of investor I was. Um, so I, you, you know, Winston Churchill once said that democracy was the worst form uh, of, 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 of political governance, system, or, except right. for all the others. And I still feel the same way about capitalism. Capitalism is the worst form of economic system, except for all the others. It's the it has produced the longest best returns uh, uh, for mankind over any other economic system I have ever seen. So that's why I have long term invested in the market and why I'm hoping to live to 90 and not really planning to change that too much. How about um, other asset classes? We always get this question, the one about what do you feel about cryptocurrencies? But I'm going to add rock posters because I know you have a special opinion. Well, I'm going to I'm going to say, hold on some. I just have to the messaging here. You know, part of the problem with being on the TV reporter for the stock market is you're constantly paranoid about where everything's going here. We're OK. The um, uh, let me just uh, well, well, two words on crypto. People ask me about crypto all the time. I, I have no opinion on Bitcoin. I am a big believer in the blockchain. I think it has tremendous revolutionary implications. So that's a disruptive technology, just like the Internet was. So believe in disruptive technologies. I have no opinion on the price of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency that runs off of the blockchain. What value does it have? It has no value at all, except what you think it's worth, which is, by the way, the same thing as rock posters. I like rock posters. I collect old 60s rock posters. Because well, I'm an old 60s guy. Look, there's the 1972 Rolling Stones tour. It's a very famous, infamous tour they did. And I collect those kinds of posters. But they don't have any value other than what's somebody going to tell them, pay me right now. It's pretty much the same with, with, with crypto. Um, if, so people ask me about investing in crypto. I, here, here's the way to look at this. What does it do for your portfolio? Look at it that way. So um, what could I say? Is, is it helping me with... Um, the rate of return is it going to help improve my rate of return i own stocks and bonds if i add crypto is it going to help my rate of return well uh what do i get when i buy a stock i get some claim on future earnings and, and a dividend do i get that with crypto uh -uh. what do i do when i get a bond well i get a level of interest payments do i get that with crypto no i don't know what crypto is doing to help my return i know you think you can get rich quick on it but I don't see any fundamental reason for it. How about risk? Well, um, is it helping me manage risk better? Well, I don't think anything that fluctuates 100% in less than a year is necessarily helping your manage risk. So you see where I'm getting here? I'm not sure what crypto does for most people's portfolio. Now, my friend Rick Edelman, who you know, Consuelo, great uh, mm -hmm. advisor, said because of this, he still believes that people should be putting money in crypto, but small amounts, one or two percent. He said if crypto moves, you know, 100 percent in a year, you're up, you know, instead of one percent, you're up two percent. That's materially different. See, that kind of advice makes some sense to me. But just think, stop thinking, OK, I'm going to get rich quick on crypto because that's what you're thinking. Stop that. That is obviously not clear. Look at what's been going on the last couple of years. And when you actually ask, what is it doing for my portfolio? You'll find it's a little harder to answer. Right. But and, and it certainly hasn't been a good diversifier, Bob. I mean, right. it, you know, that was Thank one you. of the. Exactly. Yeah, right. But the fans I, it, it sounds saying, like I'm not. anti, you know, I believe in blockchain as a disruptive technology, just like I believed in the Internet as a disruptive technology. I didn't invest in Netscape, so. <laughs> but, but I believe in the Internet. You see the difference here? Because I, I don't invest in Bitcoin. But I believe in blockchain. I never bought the Netscape, for, which was the big IPO of its day. But I believed in the internet. You see the difference? Okay, here's a question from uh, Mindy Ross. Who would you like to interview who you haven't had the opportunity to do so as yet? You know, I never did a formal interview of Jack Vogel. Of Jack Vogel. I oh, spoke really? Wow. Many times. Yeah, I yeah. regret that. He yeah. only came down here a few times to NYSC. And by the time I went to Vanguard, uh, he had been long retired um, at, as the chairman. So the guy who probably had the most influence on me, I never really uh, did a formal interview with. Um, but who I, now, Bob? 
I mean, who would you like to interview now that you haven't interviewed? Gosh. It's around. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I have a hard time thinking of somebody like that. Uh, you know, it depends on me by a formal interview. I mean, just people on the floor, I've met just about every CEO from the, from the S&P. Every celebrity, I mean, every, I they, mean, you have. They, yeah. Say hello to. Uh, Jimmy Page came down from Led Zeppelin. So here I'm revealing my old 60s roots in, in 2005 with Edgar Bronfman. And you'll remember Edgar Bronfman. Well. He ran a company called Warner Music Group. And they had the right. IPO. Seagram's family. Music. Right. Seagram's, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he was IPO in Warner Music Group in 2005. And he came to ring the bell. And he brought Jimmy Page, who was the lead guitarist for Led Zeppelin. And instead of, um, instead of uh, ringing the opening bell, uh jimmy <laughs> strapped on his guitar his very famous guitar uh and started playing the opening uh of whole lot of love and this was uh thunderous uh on the floor i mean it changed virtually everything uh and the traders had shown up with worn copies i'm trying to see if i can find it here uh they had shown up with uh worn copies of old um Led Zeppelin albums. They were waving in the air and they were all uh, going nuts about it, screaming. So Edgar, you come down the stairs and I'm sitting there with my microphone in my hand and my TV camera and there's a hundred guys with old copies of Led Zeppelin um, there and all of, you can make a left or a right going down the stairs. Come down. I'm playing this. This is a... <laughs> This is the actual opening. I, this You can see this on the internet. And there's traders are just screaming their heads off. I'm screaming my head off. Enough of that. <laughs> and Edgar comes downstairs. And it's just Edgar. And I said, where's Jimmy? And he said, Jimmy's not coming. So when you go down the stairs <laughs> to the NYSE, after you ring the bell, you can go two ways. You can make a right turn and you go downstairs onto Broad Street. And there's a limousine waiting and you can go out and avoid talking to anyone. Or you can make a left and you come down onto the floor. Edgar Bronfman came onto the floor. Jimmy made a right. And we were all like bitterly disappointed because I, I wanted to get an interview with Jimmy Page, my great hero from Led Zeppelin. All the traders wanted to get autographs. And Jimmy Page is known to have um, not like being in crowds, which sounds amazing, but he has a bit of a, a, a bit of a condition about that. And he just didn't want to do it. Um, so uh, that was sort of an interview that got away. But I, there were so many other great people that I'd spoken to there that came. Aretha Franklin was just warm and wonderful. Yeah. And, and there are so many great stories in this book, Bob. You are a fabulous storyteller yourself. Just Yeah. You know, what's fun is uh, when I was talking to the publisher, they said, can you tell us some celebrity stories? I said, well, what kind of celebrity stories do you want to hear? It's, well, just tell us a few interesting stories about people that made comments to you that you didn't think much of. So I'll, I'll tell you on quickly, uh, Barry Manilow. Now I'm not a Barry Manilow fan. Do I look like one, but the, the, he came on the floor one day, uh, a number of years ago to talk about a new album. And we did a brief interview with him. My, my colleague, uh, Bill Griffith did the interview. Um, and he comes off and it's after the close and he's just standing there. He just comes off. And I, I had, was right next to him. And I said, could, could you just tell me something? Did you actually write the, the State Farm jingle? You know, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. I said, I always heard that. He said, yeah, I did. I was a jingle writer before I became a songwriter, and I sold that for $500. That was a lot of money to me, and it became famous. Who knew? And I said, I, he said, I wrote a bunch of other things. I wrote Band-Aid commercials and things like that. And I said, you, you just sold out 15,000 seats uh, here in, in Long Island uh, at this gigantic you know, theater, Nassau Coliseum. How did you do that? He hadn't had a hit in years. This was a few years ago. And he said, you know, and he, he launched in this discussion about his career that was very profound. He said, you know, I had a lot of hits early on. And then I, I kept going and doing what I wanted to do, I, you know, doing show tunes and things like that. But I didn't have as many hits, but I just kept doing it. I really loved doing it. And I stopped worrying about having hits and being concerned. And then all of a sudden I stayed with it so long, people started calling me a legend. And now I'm selling more stuff again. So the, what he was saying was, there was a very profound thing there. He said, I, have, I had big hits early on. And then in the middle part of my career, I stopped having as many hits, but I kept doing what I really loved. I kept putting out albums and things like that. And people buy, bought them, didn't have as many hits, but you know, people still bought them. And now I stayed at it. And that to me was very profound because it happens to a lot of us, because well, like you and me. Yeah, lessons on life part. in your book. Right. 
Exactly. Yeah. The middle part of the Stick career. To what you love. You know, after 2000, where, where, you know, we had the dot com, we had the dot com bust and then 9-11, which was terrible for everybody psychologically down here. And you think about leaving and then you decide I'm going to stay because I really love it, just like he stayed. So I, who would have thought, you know, uh, Barry Manilow would have some sort of career advice. But his comment was stick with what you love. And eventually you come out on the other side. And look, you and I were very well known for this inch wide mile deep thing I was talking about, about the stock market. So there's an example of some random encounter. I mean, who knew Barry Manilow was going to say anything kind of interesting at all? I, I didn't think so. But he turned out to very much impress me. <laughs> uh, like follow this. the Fed, follow Pisani. Right. Yeah, we've got to wrap this up, right? We do. We're, we're in overtime. It's been fascinating. This has yeah. flown by one of the quickest hours we've ever had. Wonderful to hear from you. So on behalf um, of the Gabelli School, the CFA Society of New York, thank you. Uh, and the museum, of course, Bob and Consuelo. We're back uh, next Tuesday with the Princeton professor, uh, Derek Liedow on The Entrepreneurs, The Relentless Quest for Value. We'll see you then. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for attending.